Hi, I'm Alex Lamy and I'm here to show you some music I've written using a new collection from orchestral tools called Andea. Andea is a library of instruments from the Americas made in collaboration with Richard Harvey and all recorded at his studio in London, using some unique instruments from his vast collection. I'm very fortunate to have worked with Richard for a number of years now, recording and mixing his music, so I've become very familiar with many of the instruments in Andea as I've recorded those same instruments many times on various projects. That obviously came in handy when engineering these sampling sessions and also when writing the music that I'm about to show you. What I wanted to show you today is how you might use this collection in a modern cinematic sense, how it might work in an underscore and to get you thinking about how you might use these South and Central American instruments in a different context. So let's take a listen to the music. Well there you go, let's start looking at some things in detail. We open up very softly, I'm just using a couple of string patches from the Tallinn and Time Micro Libraries to accompany the Ron Rocco from Andia, creating a quiet, undulating texture while the Ron Rocco delivers the theme of the piece. Now for me the Ron Rocco is really the star of this library. It's a beautiful instrument with loads of character, loads of resonance and it's beautifully captured here. I've used the sustained chromatic patch so you can see and hear exactly what comes up when you first open the instrument. You can find a lot more information on the specifics of each instrument in a walkthrough that Richard Harvey has made, but in essence we've given you two versions of some of these stringed instruments. The instant playable version, and then the regular sustains patch that's laid out just as the instrument is, with full control over which strings are producing each note, meaning you can program up some lovely, realistic patterns where the same pitches are played on different strings. This so-called instant version has a lot of the randomness that you'd get from a real performer, moving between finger and thumb articulations automatically, and then occasionally adding in those extra octaves found on the other strings. It's great for chord patterns, but it works just as well programming up melodic lines like this.
This Ron Rocco melody is then followed by the trez, using that same regular sustains patch here so you can see that you have control over which string is sustaining. And I do the same thing on the Ron Rocco when it comes back in afterwards with a nice spread chord. Already you can probably hear that the reverb is an important part of the sound here. Having mixed a lot of Richard Harvey's music, I've spent a lot of time working on the production and reverbs that really get these instruments singing. And one specific example is the reverb that you're hearing on the lead instruments in the intro here. It's an impulse response sampled from a Lexicon 960L unit, which for me is the creme de la creme of reverbs. My choices of reverb are all pretty deliberate. I'm using four different reverbs in this track, which sounds like a lot and is probably more than I'd normally use when writing, but they all serve different purposes. Firstly, we have that Lexicon 960 Hall, which as I said is my star reverb. It has loads of initial early bloom and you can really hear the reverb triggered even by soft notes. But if I'd put everything into this, it would be overpowering and muddy. So I've used another convolution reverb here, this time with a real space loaded. East West Spaces 2 with the abandoned Abbey preset loaded. It's a big, cavernous sounding reverb, but it's still very diffuse with a long, even tail. It's great for pushing things back into this atmospheric area, which is what I'm doing with the strings at the beginning of the track. Next is the algorithmic hall reverb TSAR1 by Softube. This is a great, simple reverb, and it does something similar to the 960L, but with less early bloom and more sparkle towards the end of the tail in the high frequencies, which is where this reverb really stands out. I've used it on the Native American flute and the Pinkuo staccatos that come a bit later in the piece to get some of that sparkle out of them while allowing them to sit back in the mix. <laughs> Lastly, we have another East-West Spaces 2 patch. Again, another well-known Lexicon hardware reverb, but this one is a digital hall that's a staple for many orchestral mixes. Let's listen to some of those in context. We have a little pause before we kick into the second section here. You'll hear the giant oakwood log drum sent into that cavernous abandoned church, along with a breathy long note from the Toyo's panpipe, before a quick percussion blast into the new section. So now we're in 5-8 time, which gives us some propulsion, and I've started to feature some of the percussion from Andia. We have a shaker pattern that's made from a combination of the cha-chas, which are shakers made from llama hooves, the stick nut shaker, and some good old maracas. The low part of the pattern has a cajon. It's the roomier and less bassy of the two that we've sampled. Next we have the Cajito Coplera, which is a South American frame drum. I've loaded two spot mics and a little reverb. And then probably my favourite percussion instrument in the library, which is one of our low bombo drums. It's one of three that we sampled. Now, I'm not doing much processing on these, just a little compression, uh, as these things make a real noise when you thump them. In this section, we also get a lot of the plucked strings from the library. So let's take a listen to them soloed. There's a lot to unpack there. Ron Rocco, star of the show at the start again, paired with the wonderful sound of the twangy teat play on the tune, making a 6-8 melody fit into 5-8. And then underneath those we have the charango doing some noodling arpeggiated stuff on the chords, along with the quattro trem random patch, which is single notes picked out at random intervals, all happening at different times when you hold down a chord, for a texture where notes are sort of randomly popping out here and there and then they're joined by another Ron Rocco playing more fingerstyle chord patterns as well. We haven't mentioned the guitar yet. 
In this section it starts playing some strum chords that we recorded, along with the T plate also playing strum chords and the guitar on playing bass, which is just such a great sound. I can't get over how good the guitar on is with those bass notes. They sustain beautifully, but maybe because I like them so much I've really made a meal out of them by adding a bit of extra sub on the EQ and a bit of crunch from a compressor, not unlike how you might treat a regular bass here. And then finally we have something really cool in here which is the guitar on effects patch, which is just a lot of knocks and noises on the body of the guitar on. With a bit of compression on it, it's basically become another percussion part. You get the picture, lots of cool stuff in there. It was really fun programming that, but I pretty quickly forgot that I was dealing with sampled instruments. My mind almost went straight into mixing mode where I was making decisions about which instruments to pull up, which to feature more, and there's really no need to tuck anything away. Musically, I'd already started to feel we were on a journey here, and I wanted that big cinematic moment. If this were a score to a movie or a TV show, I sort of had this idea that we'd be suddenly presented with some beautiful vista, like the view from the top of a canyon. So, we call on some of the other Orchestral Tools collections here again, using some drums and cymbals from Berlin Percussion, and some string patches from the Berlin Strings Library and Metropolis Arc 2. Here's what the percussion is doing. I also sneakily added in a couple more Metropolis Arc 2 patches to bolster the strings here and add the weight that I wanted this big section to have. We have some flugelhorn swells and a combination of bass clarinets and tubers doubling the bass line. Of course, at this point, it's really Andea that's the highlight again, this time using the woodwinds for the tune all the way to the end. One thing I love about this library is that even though the winds each have their own characters, they trade between each other beautifully. We get four of them from here. The Pinkuyo starts off with that strident high register on the melody, doubled by the violins, and then the Cana takes over on the repeat of the tune. Then there's this lovely trade between the Cana and the Peruvian Ocarina going into the last part of the track, and then finally the Mosenio picks up for this mysterious introspective ending in a husky lower register. Listen to those last three with a bit of isolation from the louder stuff. We'll just solo the strings and the winds here. We're back to something a bit more intimate for the ending. The Mosenio plays us out, as you just heard. The Ron Rocco does a bit more noodling on some E minor and C major chords. And we have some solo strings from the Time Micro and Amber Creative Soundpack libraries behind them. We also have some whispering effects I've put in using the pan pipes from Andia. I've used pan pipes a few times in this track. They're obviously a staple sound for this world of instruments, but I also felt compelled to play around with some effects on them, making use of that breathy, chiffy quality. The long effects that I just played are made using some plugins from Valhalla DSP, their Valhalla Room Reverb and then Shimmer, one after the other, to really transform whatever signal is going into them into this almost endless pad. And there you have it. I hope I didn't miss out anything important, but if I did, you can always find out more over at the Orchestral Tools website. Be sure to check out the videos that Richard Harvey and Sasha Noor have put together and I hope you have as much fun with the Andea collection as I have. Thanks very much for watching. <laughs>